everybody. Welcome to the Seclair Chatterbox. And uh, and, and we're having a, uh, a special episode talking about pet loss. Uh, with me, as usual, is my co-host and therapist here at Seclair, Kirza Mason. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Mike? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, also joining us is Rick St. John, a poet. How are you today? Hello. And pet owner. <laughs> and pet owner, of course, of course. Uh, but of course, uh, the kind of the star of the show for this episode is Karen Litz- Litzinger. Karen Litzinger. Oh, I do. Uh, she's a national certified counselor with a long term interest in pet loss and uh, bereavement and a professional member of the National Speakers Association. How are you doing today? I'm really good. Happy to be here. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, I mean, this is a topic that's kind of hidden myself. Uh, ironically, the timing has been interesting because uh, my, my own my own dog, Bijou, is, uh, is, is kind of waning in their years. And the discussion's already started about, you know, they do, you know at what point is he going to, 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 you know, to let her go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where pet loss starts before the animal even dies because... Mm-hmm. That's part. That's the beginning of the loss. Besides making the decision, just it's called sometimes anticipatory mm-hmm. grief and anticipatory bereavement. Tough decisions. It is. It is. Carrie, you you uh, are doing something pretty unique here with with a, a whole program that you developed for people to heal from pet loss. Can you talk a little bit about what got you into this? You know, why pet loss? Sure, sure. Here's uh, actually professionally, I'm a career counselor, yeah. as as you know, mm-hmm. uh, but have always had an interest in animals. And it was in the mid '90s that my mother invited me to an animal blessing, mm-hmm. and I got interested in all pieces and was doing some memorial services and animal blessings just informally with friends and family and uh, sort of on a volunteer basis. And at at one point, I needed more credits to keep up my counseling certification, Mm. and there wasn't (laughs) funds where I happened to be, and decided to do a week-long training through the American Academy of Bereavement. Mm. Still didn't really do anything with pet loss, Mm -hmm. decided to keep that up. But the, the turning point really was in 2006 when my dog Pepper died. Mm. Um, and I had him as a pup from a puppy and he was 15. Mm. And I was bringing his cremains home from the vet. And that's when I had this inspiration that I wanted to help others because mm. I kind of knew some things that I wanted to do, what I did to take care of myself. I mean, I called off my clients. You know, I took a day, bereavement time mm. off. I, did a photo album of pictures that I had been collecting for Pepper. And so that was the point where I thought I wanted to help others. And so that flash really first became the CD uh, mm-hmm. uh, that I produced and, and then moved on to pet loss counseling. Often people find that they, they're needing something for themselves and it isn't there. And so they create something like you did for yourself and then discover, wow, this is something that could benefit everyone. It sounds like that might have been the path for you. Mm-hmm. There wasn't. What was there for you when you were bereaved with your own loss? What did you find out there? Where do people go oh, to find things? Oh, well, there are, you got I, yeah, CD, I knew. But well, what, I knew what, about what, things that were yeah, out there, which yeah. is why I wanted to let other people okay. know. I mean, besides the CD really wasn't for me. It was definitely mm-hmm. for other people, other people because I had already been taking care of, of mm-hmm. myself and, um, you know, through some of the rituals I mentioned. But one of the resources that is out there that I really like people to know about is the Association for Pet Loss and Bereavement. And uh, the website on that is aplb.org. Uh, I had found them, I think, when I was getting recertified as a bereavement facilitator through the American Academy in Bereavement, that week-long certification, Mm -hmm. because I wasn't practicing. Mm -hmm. I needed to, like, Mm -hmm. retake a test and do different things. And so I found them and did an internship through the Association for Pet Loss and Bereavement, and they host chat rooms. Speaking of technology, here we are in the podcast. They uh, host five days a week pet loss chat rooms uh, where people can log in and get support and find other like-minded people. And so I was actually a host uh, assistant, you know, intern in one of the chat rooms. And the the other resource, just coming back to your uh, 
Be- Bijou, is it Bijou? Bijou. Bijou we right? didn't name her. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. They, they come with names now. My pepper was, you know, number one, two, three, nine. From I, the did, I, rescue I didn't even know how to spell it until, uh, <laughs> until uh, Bijou Phillips was in, like, one of those horror movies or something. And I saw her on the front cover of, like, a Maxim or something at the grocery store. Like, oh, that's how we spell yeah. it. And what oh, does Bijou true. mean? I don't know. I you think it's French or something. Like no, it, the Iris was, uh, she was given a second hand. She's, oh, we don't even know how old she is. Uh-huh. But she had to been, at, we were told, at least 10 years old or so. And uh, it was actually a friend of my mother-in-law's. Uh-huh. And she was passing. And we kind of inherited her. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> she, second hand As gone. you say, she, she's supposed to go to New York with my in-laws, but she kind of found us yes. and decided to stay in Pittsburgh. It's, it's wonderful when things, <laughs> those adoptions happen that way. But but I did want to mention a resource to you mm-hmm. related to the Association for Pellas and Bereavement is they actually have a chat room monthly about the euthanasia decision. Mm-hmm. And I would say that was as helpful or more helpful to me than even the pet loss chat rooms you know, even though they're all good, but I needed that more. And what was the what was the issue for you around euthanasia? Uh, with Pepper, he was uh, 15 and did not have a specific disease. He just was losing. He lost over half his weight. Mm-hmm. And it was very gradual over many months, at mm-hmm. least a half year or more. Uh, and just hearing other people and where they were in the decision, it just helped sort of put things in perspective. Like when one person who was faced with a serious illness with their dog is saying, well, but it's still chasing squirrels, you know, and I'm thinking, mm-hmm. oh, you know, I'm carrying my dog out to the, yeah. you know, go to the bathroom, you know, so those are tough, tough decisions. Mm-hmm. Very tough decision. We had, we had a decision like that to make three years ago in November. We had a, a 14 and a half year old uh, mixed terrier uh, smudge who uh, looked in the wintertime like Benji and looked like a schnauzer in the summer with ears and a tail. And so that's how we, we get her trimmed. And she always looked like a puppy, always acted like a puppy, but she had developed uh, an enlarged heart mm-hmm. and was slowing down and having difficulties. And, uh, you know, we accepted she was slowing down and didn't push her at all, but she couldn't really even walk around the block anymore. But then she lost control of her bladder. So then we did the diaper thing, which she hated. She absolutely hated, but she tolerated because what could she do? And uh, then she lost control of her bowels, which we couldn't tolerate mm-hmm. because we couldn't leave her during the day. Mm-hmm. And there was no, there's no way of putting a diaper on the dog for bowel control. And it was clear that it was time that she really couldn't stand it herself. Mm-hmm. She couldn't be a dog anymore. She couldn't. But but the, the euthanasia, the loss and the mm-hmm. guilt and the beating self, you know, oneself up is is really, I think, what's unique and, and was part it's of the part inspiration of the, the for of doing loss this. Itself, yeah. You're saying here's here's some interesting factoids uh, because this this is not something that just concerns a couple of people. Mm-hmm. You know, the people around here and a few people we know. Mm-hmm. According to the American Pet Products Association 2009 to 10 National Pet Owner Survey, 62 mm-hmm. percent of households I would have thought it was higher actually. Everybody in my neighborhood has pets in the U.S. have at least one pet. With 71.4 million homes, this is a lot of heartache when a pet dies. That's a lot of pets. That is. Mm-hmm. And when you figure, well, here's the other thing. People consider themselves, their pets, family members. Right. And, and I mean, the issue is for so many years, it was sort of not talked about or mm-hmm. you didn't reach out to folks because people weren't so kind. They mm-hmm. did, you know, the, the role of animals has evolved, you mm-hmm. know, in our society. And I really think, you know, things are changing. And I, I think, frankly, even things like the Internet and the Association for Pet Loss and Bereavement and the International Candle Ceremony that's a lovely um opportunity on Monday evenings. It's translated into 30 languages. Yeah, all of this, I think, allows pet loss to be seen more legitimately. Mm -hmm. Uh, But in the past, people didn't reach out because people would say, oh, it's only a cat or just get another dog. Right. Yeah, and and it's funny, people, you often hear people say, you know, well, just go get another pet, you know, immediately, right Mm -hmm. after, as as if we would do that with a family member. Well, my my, my daughter died, well, just go get a new daughter. You know, that's absurd, and of course, we would never think that. Or if your spouse dies, well, just go get another spouse. Mm -hmm. Uh, We can't (laughs) replace people or beings that we love that easily. So, in your experience, what kind of a time frame are we talking about Mm -hmm. for people who who lose a pet? You know, um... 
time frame is always so hard to talk about, you know, whether it's time frame of mm. grieving or mm. time frame of getting another animal. Mm. And I, what I would say is most pet loss counselors traditionally have said less about time frame, but more about waiting to make sure that you've processed mm. somewhat, have experienced the grief and that you're not just getting a replacement. Mm. Um, Having said that, you know, I've also seen people successfully be able to get an animal quite soon mm -hmm. after. Um, when my latest dog, Tika, died in March, one of the people who used my CD and loved it emailed and said, you know, go right now and get mm -hmm. another bundle of love so you can have someone to share your love with. Because she mm -hmm. did that and she was very fine with it. And I had another person who tried so hard to really find a dog that was just like her dog that mm -hmm. died. And she admitted she, she, she was looking for her dog yeah. worldwide on wow. the internet to adopt a dog. And when she found it and she was moving forward and she decided maybe not to do it, and her husband said yes, she, she, she didn't bond with the dog mm -hmm. because it was more of a replacement. So it's more, you know, watching that you're not replacing. And sometimes we say not to get necessarily the same breed or maybe a different color if it's the same breed, maybe a different mm -hmm. sex if it's the same breed. So what you're talking about is really paying attention to yourself, yes. listening to yourself, knowing where you are yes. psychologically, what the process yes. is for you. And it's yes. going to be different for everybody. Right. Right. And it we, sounds like also, if I'm hearing you right, acknowledging that each, not only is each person unique, but each pet is unique. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. so this replacement idea is a fallacy. Mm -hmm. Right. And people don't always realize they're doing mm -hmm. it either. Mm -hmm. You know, so that self awareness you're talking about yeah. too is so significant. Yeah. We waited about five months after Smudge died to get another dog, and we made some major mistakes in what we did and ended up with another euthanasia, which was really traumatic. We went to the Animal Rescue League and um, found a dog I really liked and went back to get it, and it had already been kind of taken by someone else who had been in the process of looking at this dog as a companion for, for their, their first dog. And I was heartbroken over that. And they encouraged me to look at other dogs there. And I should have just left and mm -hmm. taken the time because that heartbreak wasn't just about losing that dog. It was, but I didn't listen to myself. So, mm -hmm. you know, red flag number one. Mm -hmm. So I found a dog and, and I also found a large dog, which I really didn't want, but got a lot of pressure from my family. Family members who didn't even live at home anymore, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> get a big dog, get a big dog, who never liked the fact that, that Smudge was small. And so I found this uh, this lab mix. There are a million and one lab mixes at the, at the shelters, uh, which turned out to be more of a, a greyhound than, than a lab, just happened to be black. And uh, so we took her home, and uh, uh, she was a very bright dog, beautiful dog, um, had been taken, and this was the other red flag I didn't listen to. And when I looked at her history, she had been returned twice. Okay, and when I tried to get information about why this dog had been returned a second time, the information was pretty scant and they kind of blew me off. And that, you know, I was surprised at myself for just not persisting with this. It goes to show you that my own process was just, I was not aware enough of what was going on to really function the way I normally do. And that would have been a red flag that I never would have ignored. Brought this dog home and it was over the the holiday time. So I had uh, adult children at home and this dog came, came into a family situation where there were five grown people giving it lots of attention for a couple of weeks. And then three of them left. And then this dog is home alone a good bit of the time. Really stupid situation. Just not a good situation, right? Dog did as well as she could, although she had a lot of difficulty with uh, with um, being alone because she would try, if someone came to the door like the, the mail carrier, she would try to burst through the window. It was just safe. So we had to cage her, which psychologically for this dog was not a good idea, but it was the only thing we could do. Well, ultimately, um, this dog, within five months, uh, had something wrong with her. She was losing weight, and that didn't know what was wrong. And uh, uh, we kept feeding her. She was eating enough for a 75-pound dog, and she just kept losing weight. So we were just at the point of taking her back to get a more detailed uh, 
evaluation of her, and she became enraged, became insane, they call it, mm-hmm. a cage insanity or whatever, and attacked a neighbor dog. Mm-hmm. And twice, two dogs in one day, and one she actually caused an injury. So we had to take her back. And taking her back, she tried to attack every dog that came out of the shelter with a walker and even tried to attack the personnel there. Mm -hmm. And so this was a dog that had to be euthanized, not because of a health issue, Mm -hmm. maybe because of health, we didn't know, Mm -hmm. but because whatever the treatment had been prior to that, and probably also some of you know, our mistakes in terms of, of not understanding the psychology of this dog added to um, the, the distress, and the dog was not able to be a pet any longer, mm-hmm. and so it had to be destroyed. Um, so that was that was tough. terrible. Tough. So, so, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> decisions happen sometimes that you can't even foresee. Right. You know, certainly when we brought this dog home, there was just no indication that, that this would be the trajectory of, yeah. of that experience. So many, so many difficult situations. Mm-hmm. Right. But I, but when I think back on it, I realize that that part of the problem in choosing this dog was that I wasn't listening to myself. I hadn't done the amount of psychological work I needed to do to be ready for a new pet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And now, um, reading the notes here, this is this is interesting. We talked about the community, so there's chat rooms. It's interesting that, that people are finding help digitally like this. But uh, uh, the trends in bereavement uh, it, it mentions here: the uh, animal hospitals have social workers on staff, pet funeral homes, uh, emergency planning. Uh, uh, Thinks that people not wanting to leave pets behind in Hurricane Katrina. Mm-hmm. I mean that, and you mentioned before about how how the the role of animals have changed a lot in the last few generations. Mm-hmm. Or right. well, I think from I won't say time wise, but certainly there were more farm animals and mm-hmm. outdoor mm-hmm. animals, and so that was probably more common. And then they were animals more as workers, as workers, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And and then as they you know became more part of the family inside. There was that bond. And then, of course, we have smaller families Mm -hmm. uh, and more people are living alone or maybe never married or people's children leave and they go across Mm -hmm. the country. And so it's that animal that is there as the constant. And that's related to one of the most significant things I remember reading in the first book I read in 1995 was the whole concept of how people may grieve more deeply mm-hmm. with the loss of an animal than a loss of a, of a human. And I'm mm-hmm. often asked about, you know, Why do you think what that is that about? Yeah. You know, I think the first, my first thought is always it's the unconditional love mm-hmm. because, you know, there's no emotional baggage. Mm-hmm. There's no history there mm-hmm. with conflict with parents or kids mm-hmm. or any of Pet that. Pet doesn't care how much money you make, what right. clothes you wear, what your house <laughs> looks like. <laughs> All of that. You feed them, you take care of them, they love yeah. you. Yeah. You know, and then I think, too, you know, when, say, a, a parent dies, they're, they're often and usually not living with you, where the animal mm-hmm. is living with you. So it's more of a constant mm-hmm. companion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting to see because well, my father grew up on a on a farm, and I know growing up the animals were mostly kept outside. You know, and and you, you made decision: do we bring them in for the winter? Was was the thing in, in my family? Uh, as opposed to now, more city living, and the the animals are there underfoot <laughs> in the house all the time. And, and then that, that that that's definitely something you see more of. You know, yeah. my sister lives in the country, and they keep a coon dog. Mm-hmm. outside uh, to hunt with and as a watchdog and the, and the dog has a, a dog house and is chained up with a fairly large chain can you know get around and, uh, but dog doesn't come inside and the dog's not a pet mm-hmm. and so you know doesn't get used for hunting very often but sometimes does and you know I suspect that when it's time for that dog to go uh, my brother-in-law is going to go out with a shotgun and shoot the dog and bury in the woods mm-hmm. and that's going to be the end of it mm-hmm. um, it's and it is a different kind of relationship the dog doesn't expect uh, anything different either mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. it's it's a working dog and mm-hmm. it gets fed and it gets a chance to do its dog thing mm-hmm. um, and it's not expecting a more intimate relationship either so mm-hmm. there's that piece of it you yeah. know the dog's expectation the dog's experience you know uh, I wonder what your experience is with that and we're talking about people losing uh, pet loss and the process of, of, of pet loss but what about pets you know, experience of loss. I'm thinking about some, you know, we're in, a, in an economic situation right now where a lot of people are surrendering pets because they can't afford mm-hmm, them. Mm-hmm. So these are loved animals who are going to shelters. May, many of them are being euthanized, unfortunately, because there aren't enough homes. But when they're coming into new homes, what's the experience of that pet like? Because they're also dealing with the loss of their former mm-hmm. family mm-hmm. and their former place. And how does that, you know, get 
how does that play out in, in terms of, you know, people's relationships with this new pet? <laughs> I have to say, too, so that's more of an animal animal behaviorist yeah, question. Yeah, okay, that's so that's kind of out of it. But I always right, think of the, right. the other side right, of this. But right. well, but, but in terms of, 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 you know, the pet's experience and, and our experience, I was thinking, uh, some, uh, James was in here a little bit ago talking about custody issues with pets, mm -hmm. and we've got that coming up now with people divorcing who don't have children but are sharing custody of pets. Mm -hmm. So and, there's, yeah, uh, the loss. The right. loss. And sometimes it gets uglier than the child issues. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you don't have to decide what school to take them to. Although maybe what doggy daycare to take them to. So. <laughs> Does that come up at all for you in, in the work? Well, it, I mean, it it hasn't in no. in in my work. You know, I think that I mean, it's it's probably cutting edge enough for people to acknowledge pet loss from death. I don't mm. think people would be acknowledging that kind pet of loss, loss from, and seeking out a yeah. a counselor. But I think your earlier comment mm. about the relationship is significant because Rick and I were talking about that on the on the way in. Mm. And you had, you know, some thoughts about that. You want to share those, Rick? Well, um, no, I'm not entirely remembering Remember what it was. Okay. <laughs> but, That's why. If yeah. it's okay, I don't want to take us off the this uh, um, custody thing if you want to stay on that. But mm -hmm. I, when you were talking about your, was it your brother's dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah the coon dog. Um, the coon dog and about... You know him. In, you know, at some point, they he, you're imagining that he might just kill this dog. That made me think about another set of things that's unique about our pet relationships, which is, you know, I've been present for the the death right there mm -hmm. with multiple pets, mm -hmm. but haven't ever been present, physically present in the room for the death of relatives. Mm -hmm. And I think that gets at another element in which. Mm -hmm this relationship is particularly charged and mm. particularly deep. Mm -hmm. yeah. But some of that's the circumstances. We're yeah. so, with humans, so, so mechanized, hospi awesome. yeah, mechanized yeah. And, and hospital oriented. It's more real, you know, with the animal death. And it's often a teaching experience mm -hmm. for children as well. And, you know, one mm -hmm. of the questions that comes up often related to the euthanasia piece back to that, Mike, and I remember this was one of the most significant learning pieces through the Association for Pet Loss and Bereavement was, do you want to be in the room during mm -hmm. the euthanasia or not? They and, do give you that choice. Yeah, they yeah. give you the choice, and if you're able to do that, it allows for some final closure. And the piece that I found most interesting and valuable was the suggestion of if you have another animal, to have them in the space because mm. they're at that root mm. level of being able to understand death mm -hmm. and understand the animal is no longer there. And so that helps with yeah. later behavioral yeah. mm -hmm. issues, actually. Mm -hmm. That makes some sense. We, we had two dogs at one time, and when the, we had a golden retriever, and when we had to euthanize her, Smudge was alive at the time. Mm -hmm. And she walked around for several days mm -hmm. looking, and it was clear that she was wondering, where is where's, yeah. uh, Sam? And uh, then it, it just she, it clicked. You know, I could mm -hmm. almost see, she was kind of dog. You could sort of see her thinking, and when something would click, it was like, oh. And, of course, she was no longer having to, to fight for uh, for place in the pack, mm -hmm. and she relaxed considerably being mm -hmm. the only dog at that point. But it, it did take her some time, and it never occurred to us to take her with us. Oh, never would occur to um, me but either. That's, that's a, just a really interesting one idea. of the tips that are, yeah. um, I think, significant. Yeah. Yeah. Is it something that vets encourage in your experience? Oh, I don't think they probably even mention it. Yeah. You know, it's it well, I be, never it's just another that. day. <laughs> just well, no, no, no. I wouldn't say that at all. No, no. no I'm doing the vet training. You know, they are yeah. very most of them having emotional reactions. And one of the vets said to me in the training session that I did that the coaching she got from a mentor vet is, you know, once you stop feeling, mm -hmm. that's a time to be, you know, moving on. Now when that's the time to move on to a new vet, when your vet stopped feeling. If you have that experience that your vet doesn't care about your right. experience of right. losing mm -hmm. your dog, it's time to find a new vet. Right. But I think, you know, the, the, again, most some of the most significant things related to euthanasia, and, and this happens in all bereavement, but I think it happens, again, more with animals, is the whole guilt and beating yourself mm -hmm. up on uh, about things. Karen Horney's, you know, should have, right. could have right. stage. Right. And, um, but because animals can't talk, you know, they're like our babies. Mm -hmm. They're at that stage. I think that is very significant. And that's really why with the CD, I got into the whole cognitive 
psychology piece, mm-hmm. that's really what it's rooted in. Is right. you know we beat ourselves up, right. either saying, um, not validating mm-hmm. the depth of the loss, where mm-hmm. where we might say to ourselves, "Oh, I shouldn't be grieving so much." Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it, it's more you know helpful to reframe that and yeah. say. It's normal and natural for me to be grieving, you know, or in the euthanasia role, you know, we get into as, as you were saying, Rick, you know, was it too soon? Was it too long? And, and all of that. And I had that experience myself. And so we might be saying that to ourselves. Did I wait too long? You know, did I do this too soon? Uh, and then to reframe that to say, you know, I made the best decision that I could with the information that I had, you know, and remember, I remember that I was a loving caretaker for my animal Mm -hmm. throughout their lifetime. And also to accept the limitations that you really have. You know, when I, we thought about, you know, someone else might have taken this dog, the Kia, the one that had to go back to the, to the pound uh, and, and, and be destroyed. You know, someone else might have been able to take this dog in hand and aside from the fact that there was probably an underlying medical issue, but it had there not been to take this dog in hand and train it and do the work it needed, they needed to do to socialize this dog. And, but that wasn't something we had the capacity to do, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. right. and, and that's hard to recognize that if, if this dog had been with someone who had that capacity, it might have, it might have been able to have a longer life, but it wasn't. Right. And so we had to comfort ourselves with the, the reality that for five months, this dog got a good life. That's nice. And that was the best that's we good. could do. No, that's excellent. That's uh, actually one of the trainings that one was talking about just that thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I gave... Right. You know, they had a good experience during that time. You enriched their life during that time. Right. right. Well, I see here that you have won the 2010 Pinnacle Award for Best Book in the category of Animals and Pets in April, as well as the 2010 National Indie Excellence Award for Audio Book Nonfiction in May. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, that's Thank very you. exciting. Yeah, it was, it was very exciting. I'm very proud of that. Actually, and recently... I uh, the CD was just reviewed in the Journal of American Veterinary Medical Association. That's a big deal. And yeah, uh, positively is one of the yeah. things. Was it positively? <laughs> yes, it was positively. <laughs> so the CD that we're talking about is Heal Your Heart, Coping with the Loss of a Pet? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us something about what's on that CD? It's very experiential. Uh, it's rooted in cognitive psychology, so there are affirmation statements like the ones that mm-hmm. I share to help people think of better ways to talk to themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a guided meditation in it. There's a little introduction to each section that's educational in nature. And then there's lovely harp music that mm-hmm. I uh, had a collaborator, Faith Stenning, mm-hmm. uh, work on with me. So it's, and there's a booklet, a 20 page booklet that has the different resources that I mentioned, the different websites and a little education as well. Now this has been out for how long, this CD? Uh, 2009. Okay, so a couple of years, you had a chance to get some feedback from people mm-hmm. who used your Mm-hmm. your material what's what's been your experience with that well you know positive things mostly with the people i hear from and say you know positive things uh, the one person who probably had emailed back and forth the most said that you know she just cried so much so much you know after the loss and she thought she would never be able to look at a picture of her animal again mm-hmm. and and really through the process of the cd she was able to you know l- you know, look positively, you know, at pictures. Uh, the goal is to have, you know, process the tears, mm-hmm. but have more memories and space and positive, uh, uh, what, I guess, memories, you know, in one's heart. And so that mm-hmm. shift. And she said it helped her with the, to be ready to adopt mm-hmm. as well, because that was processing. And, you know, a lot of tears can be in the, in the CD, but that's part of moving, moving mm-hmm. through. So it's holding those two opposites in a way, and that, that dialectic that we talk about so much at Claire, you know, holding the grief and allowing ourselves to, to do the grief, and at the same time, recognizing that life goes on, mm-hmm. and that we, you know, have to accept where we are, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, where we might go, mm-hmm. at the same time, doing both of those things, which seem like opposites, mm-hmm. but in fact, we try to synthesize those opposites and come up with uh, with a level of comfort uh, with what we're doing in our lives, mm-hmm. and we're doing that with this material, that's wonderful. It's been an interesting journey because I also do pet loss counseling through my practice now, mm-hmm. which wasn't necessarily what I was intending to do. I just felt called mm-hmm. to do the CD, and so I'm hearing mm-hmm. more people's stories through that as well. Well, as a clinician, I'm interested in this because I know that I, I see I see people, and I ask people in the course of uh, 
uh, of my work, you know, do they have pets at home? And, and what's the relationship with pets? And sometimes I forget to do that. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting when you forget how often um, people come in with, with issues, with, with emotional stuff, you're where's that coming from? And if you're not knowing what the, the dynamics of the family are, including pets, mm -hmm. you can really easily miss something very important. So what would you recommend that clinicians do to kind of increase their awareness of the importance of pets and pet loss in, in their clients' lives? Well, again, I'm focusing on pet loss, not the, the uh, family systems piece mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, I mean, just to understand themselves the depth of the loss. Mm -hmm. And and frankly, some people just don't get it. Mm -hmm. And um, you do, I know. Uh, from <laughs> well, I was our, fortunately, full our... disclosure, I was fortunate to, to participate in a training that Karen did for the uh, um, Employees Assistance Professionals mm -hmm. of America mm -hmm. program went about six or eight months ago. Right, right. And you presented this material, and I've used it, and I've given your materials to clients, and they love it. And it's it's really helped uh, enormously. And I've had people come in who really sat down, and that was the issue they came in with. Right, right. Which, uh, you know, I'm seeing more of that than I ever have before. So I, I think that the work you're doing that other people are doing and making this something that we can talk about is helping people to actually come forward and deal with those. I mean, instead of feeling ashamed that they feel this attachment right. or feeling like it's not okay to talk about this loss because it was, quote, only a pet. Right. But uh, people are out there now and, and, and ready to deal with it. And I, and I think for clinicians to know about the resources, you know, whether mm -hmm. they're doing the counseling on their own and, and knowing about the, the websites, the, the resources that are out there, but also to know, you know, that there are specialized people doing it, just mm -hmm. like, you know, I can't do marriage and family counseling. I'm a career counselor and a pet loss counselor that we all have our specialties and can reach out when, when appropriate. Okay. Well, the question I think I'd like to ask is, I mean, is there anything you'd want to say to us many pet owners who aren't immediately facing the loss of a pet, but things we should keep in mind in advance mm -hmm. for ourselves? That's a good question. Yeah. Well, people don't like to think about any of that in advance, but just to, to say, you know, this is, this is part of the journey. You know, we have these precious animals in our lives, and when we accept that part of the journey, some of that is making the courageous, humane decision of euthanasia at, at a point. And to know there's no right or wrong time of that. You just do the best you can. You get the resources that you can during that time. And after, and to not beat yourself, you know, up over mm -hmm. things. Just do the best you can and honor, mm -hmm. honor that, and use the resources that are available. Oh, I think that's a good point to I end us so. on. Yeah, well, so. thank you, Kim, for joining us. Uh, if, if anybody wants to find out uh, more information online or, or to find your CD, is there anywhere in particular they can go? Yes, yeah, my website is uh, healfrompetloss.com. And you can order the CD right on online there. And there's some nice links to all the sites that I mentioned uh, as well and information about my counseling practice. And that's healfrompetloss.com. And my phone number is 412-242-7045 if folks prefer that. Well, it was great having you, and we'll maybe have you come back with your other hat as a... Uh, um, employment or uh, career counselor, career counselor. Uh, certainly we've got lots of people concerned about their careers and, and concerned about at jobs at this point and getting some some hints about how to deal with that and mm -hmm. uh, some resources might be helpful too so be yeah. happy to thanks Great. for having me yeah, excellent thank you to you sir as always rick thanks for joining thanks. us thanks, thanks for letting me be part of this session. Sure. <laughs> and if uh if you have anything you want to chime in uh about pet loss you want to share your stories uh, any questions, comments about this episode and other episodes, of course, uh, uh, email me, mike at seclair.com. And, uh, we appreciate, we appreciate the feedback we've been receiving so far in the first series of episodes as well. Uh, so thank you for that. And, uh, you can check out all the episodes, seclair.com, uh, more directly, seclair.com slash blog. We're, of course, uh, on Mediafly, iTunes, and uh, YouTube as well now. And uh, we'll be looking at uh, finding ourselves in uh, some other uh, locations as well. Stitcher. We're also on the Stitcher app if you have an iPhone or Android. So go check that out. Stitcher.com. Um, no way of avoiding us in other words. No, no. We're going to be everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all. And we'll see you guys next time on the Chatterbox.